I've been asked to speak particularly about the subject of readiness. I want you to uh, take a look at this uh, little illustration first of all. So you see the guy in his blocks. Uh, does this bring back any memories uh, to you? Um, it certainly does to me. <clears throat> I remember back to my school days when my obvious potential prowess as an athlete was tested on the track and it very quickly became apparent that I could, should stick to the chess club instead. Uh, but I think we all appreciate the, uh, the picture here of the man who's just ready uh, to start a race. He's in the blocks, he's positioning himself, and he's waiting for the bang. And as a professional athlete, he will have been trained, so to speak, to start on the B of bang, not the G of bang. Everything in him is poised and ready to go. Ready, the man will cry. Set. Go. I want to consider with you uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself as a man who was ready and set to go. Now, if we're going to think about readiness, it's as well that we start off with some scriptures. So I want to read with you several scriptures in the, the book of Hebrews. And the first one is uh, we'll find in Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 5 to 7. Here's what it says. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. That word prepared highlighted in red on our slide. Um, that's equally translated ready. And we'll find it again. Also in the book of Hebrews, just in the next chapter, chapter 11 and verse 3, there it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which were seen were not made of the things which are visible. Now obviously there's a lot of deep intellectual value in that statement, but I just want to point you to the word in red again, where it says the worlds were framed by the word of God. That word framed is exactly the same word as we found in the previous chapter, where it was translated prepared, a body you have prepared for me. The worlds were framed. There was a purposeful creation. There was a start that uh, was previously planned. And so we find that aspect in this word, ready. The world was readied from things that had not been before visible. And then on to chapter 13 of Hebrews. And here the simple word is, now may the God of peace equip you in every good thing to do his will. And you'll see it's the word equip that's highlighted. And again, it means ready. May God, the God of peace, make you ready in every good thing to do his will. So what does being ready mean? It means being prepared. It means being fit for purpose, framed. It means being equipped. And we'll see all of these things as we consider, just over the next few minutes, the life of the Lord Jesus as a man. Now, how should we go about it? We've discussed briefly the meaning of readiness. Perhaps the next thing to do is to consider how there's a link between this matter of readiness and in the Bible, the, the Bible word, a long word, sanctification. Sanctification. Sanctification means to set apart as holy. Set apart in holiness. Sanctification. Ready, set, go. We want to think about the Lord Jesus and his sanctification being set apart. We want to think about how it comes to be that he was sanctified. And then we want to think about examples, finally, of his sanctification and therefore his readiness as he was here on earth as a man. From uh, John chapter 10, first of all, and where it says in, in the, the NASB, Are you saying of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand the Father is in me, and I in the Father. And we see the way that this, this subject of sanctification of the Lord Jesus starts. It starts with divine initiative. The Father sets apart the Son for their service on earth as a man. The Father who is Spirit, God the Spirit, who is invisible, reveals himself through his Son. I and the Father are one, the Lord Jesus would say. It's recorded in John 10, isn't it? Here he says, that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. There's a close identity between Father and Son, and the Father sends the Son into the world to be its Saviour. 
and in sending him in that special way. He's setting him apart in holiness. He's saying, you're unique. There's nobody else like you. There's no one else can take your place. You're sanctified. You're set apart. You're holy. You're unique. And God makes him appear on earth as a man with that capacity. So that's an important aspect. But we learn from John 17 that it didn't stop there. In his prayer to God the Father, as he was approaching the cross, Jesus says of the disciples, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I think it's interesting to note that what the Father did in sanctifying the Son and sending him into the world, so the Son says the response from the obedient heart of that man was to sanctify himself, to set himself apart in the same way that he had been set apart by his God and Father. A perfect symmetry. I think we can uh, bear that out from another verse in John. John chapter 5 and verse 19. It says, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does also in the same way. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these. So you will be amazed. <laughs> and what we've just read about in John 5 is that the, the Son looked to the Father, saw what the Father was doing, and did exactly the same thing. He did it in like manner, as the, the verse tells us. He did likewise. How did the Son, as a man on earth, see the Father who remains in heaven so that he might know what to do? and what to say. God is spirit. He's invisible. But it says that the only begotten Son who dwells in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So that closeness to God continued on earth as it was in heaven, as it was eternally, as it is eternally. Jesus becoming the man was eternally Son of God and knew what it was to be close to the Father. And so to speak, see him doing things and hear our human language and our human experience start to be inadequate to describe the reality of that experience of the Son of God seeing the Father doing something. I want to attract your minds to Hebrews 12 and verse 14. I want to remind you that Jesus would never ask somebody to do something that he would not be prepared to do himself. So if this is an instruction toward us we must assume that he was prepared to live up to it in his own experience as a man. Follow after peace with all men. Now that's difficult enough. But it says, and the sanctification, the special setting apart, setting there, ready for obedient to the will of, the disclosed will of, of God, the sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. Oh yeah, see the Lord. How can we see the Lord? Is this talking about the day when Jesus will return? and rapture us away, take us up away from this awful scene of earth that we find ourselves in today, to be with him forever? Well, partially, yes. But I think it has a deeper meaning for you and for me today. Because we can see the Lord today. How will we see the Lord? Well, we'll see the Lord by what he's doing. Um, let, me, let me take you back to another verse in the Bible, which describes the Spirit of God's working among men. And Jesus says, you know, you know that the wind is blowing, but you can't see the wind, but you see its effects and you know that the wind is blowing. And so it is with the Spirit of God. So it is that those that are born of the Spirit, he says. You can't see the Spirit working directly, but you can see the evidence of his work. And the Lord Jesus could see the Father doing things by the evidence of his work. And I wonder if what we see in the recorded life of Jesus as the Son of Man is only a small glimpse of what the Father showed him, because he would show him the context for the actions that he would have to undertake on earth. And he would show him how people were going to react. Do you remember it says in several places that the Lord Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he knew what the people around him were thinking before even they voiced it. Or as they voiced it, but out of earshot, he knew what they had said and he knew why they had said it. How did he know? I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. And what's the Father disclosing to him? They're going to say this about you. They're gonna, this is what they're thinking about, what you've just said. And so because of this close communion between the Father and the Son, 
Jesus the man was able to understand things that were invisible to those around him. And the invisible God, the Father, discloses himself to his Son, even though he's now confined in human flesh. And the Son of Man sees what the Father in heaven is showing him and what his part is in this next particular thing that's got to happen according to the will of God. Ah, oh, this verse is so deep, isn't it? Hebrews 12 and verse 14. The sanctification, the setting apart, the special, unique holiness that's associated with closeness to God that even enables us to see the Lord, see the Lord in the outworking of his purposes. But I don't think that's the only way that the Father disclosed to the Son what the Son must do. You might say, well, of course, he would have disclosed his instructions by showing him the application of the word of God as already written. The Son had a hand in it, the Father had a hand in it, the Spirit of God enabling it to come to fruition through the writers that were chosen. And there it is, the Word of God. Ah. Right from his youngest days, Jesus would have been exposed to that faithful Word of God, and he would take it in. I want to get into now these, these examples of the sanctification of, the, of, of God the Son, of him being ready. How does he demonstrate that he's ready? And the first way that he would demonstrate he was ready, by his study of the word of God, his knowledge and application of the scriptures, as we would call them, the writings that God had caused to be originated. No doubt, like any Hebrew family, Psalm 119 would have been frequently on the lips of those in Jesus' household. You know Psalm 119? Well, he says it's the longest psalm in the Bible. I knew that already. Yes. Did you know it's got 22 sections to it? I think I knew that. Did you know that each of those sections corresponds identically to a specific letter of the Hebrew alphabet, that each starts, each section starts with that letter? And why would that be? So that somebody who's learning their ABCs might more easily be able to remember. A stands for this, B stands for that, C stands for that, in our language, in our alphabet. Aleph, Beth, Gimel. In the Hebrew that Jesus would learn, the language of the synagogue, the language of the temple, even if he was exposed to Aramaic, he would know the Hebrew language, wouldn't he? And he'd be familiar with this passage in Psalm 119. And from a child he would be taught it, so that, like any Hebrew boy, he would know from Psalm 119, and I think it's verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. In his sanctification, in his setting himself apart to do the will of God, absolutely in correspondence with what God shows him, he goes to the word of God and it guards him in his purity, in his pre-existent purity that was never lost throughout a stainless life. So that he would learn that he could keep himself and his heart according to the word of God. Absolutely lovely uh, to think of it. <clears throat> Your word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against you, says the psalmist in Psalm 119, just two verses, verses further on, verse 11. And the Lord Jesus, who never sinned and would not sin, could still learn those words from the scriptures and in his sanctification apply them as a man to himself, knowing that the word of God laid up in the heart is the best protection against the temptation of the evil one to sin. We can say that he was set apart, that he was ready uh, based upon a knowledge of the word of God because when you turn to Luke 18 and verse 31 it says Jesus took the twelve aside and told them we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled he couldn't make that statement if he didn't know what those prophecies were and he certainly did know them we might say that he would know them by right of authorship but did he not learn them too as in human capacity He'd learn them like other Hebrew lads would learn them, and young men would learn them, and men of God would learn them, and wait to see them fulfilled. But he had that special relationship with the Father that disclosed to him how that they were going to be fulfilled as he walked to the life that he did on this earth below. And so he was set apart, and he was ready to practice prayer. I just want to consider with you this, this scripture in John chapter 12, verse 49. It says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. What to say and how to say it. We might put those words instead and get the, the, the full force of the statement. 
so close was he to the Father in prayer <clears throat> that God communi communicated back to him <clears throat> how he should speak, what he should say, how he should say it. You know, there was an occasion when the Lord Jesus spent a whole night in prayer. We're told about that. And it says that it was a, the following morning that he brought the disciples together, many, many disciples, and selected 12 of them whom he called apostles. Where did he get that idea from? It wasn't an idea, was it? It was him conforming his action to what the Father had told him to say and how to say it. And in an appealing way, he went to those 12 men and called them to himself to be apostles, to be sent out from him to others. He was a man of prayer. He was ready to pray and set to do it. He was ready and set apart to meet the needs of those who were around him. Jesus knew what he would do. He knew what he would do. John chapter 6, verse 6. And he proceeds to feed the multitude, doesn't he? And what he did was perfectly in line with what he had seen the Father doing. The compassionate Father knowing the needs of this public before him. If we want to know the needs of the public before us, we'll need to be in touch with God. But there's no doubt about the Lord Jesus. For he, the sanctified man on earth, was in touch with the throne of heaven. And he knew what to do. And he knew that sometimes it's going to require extremely special power. But he was set apart in his holiness so that God could use him in a very special way. Now, just in closing, I want you to go with me to Psalm 88 and verse 15. The psalmist says there, I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. We know in the psalmist's experience it might have reflected persecution that he felt was so heavy upon him he could have been dead by the end of any day. But I want to apply it to the Lord Jesus. I'm afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. Here's the one of whom Luke records in chapter 2 verse 52 that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favour with God and man. I'm pretty sure that that doesn't mean that he had any lack of wisdom in his early years, but rather it's a matter of revelation. People observing him saw, increasingly they saw, the wisdom of God evidenced in the way that he conducted his life of sanctification and readiness. I'm afflicted and ready to die from my youth up, from the time he was found in the temple, about his father's things, the things that were of primary interest to him, as daily he'd been checking back with the father to see what was on the menu for this day. Hour by hour, perhaps, minute by minute, this lasting communion from his earliest, his earliest years from birth. <clears throat> I'm afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. I've linked it on this slide with Matthew 16, where he challenges disciples to be ready to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. He never asks what he doesn't do himself. Deny himself, take up his cross, follow him. And so here we have the example of the perfect man in perfect submission to a holy God in heaven who's showing him hour by hour what he must accomplish in his life as a man. He comes to his hour and he doesn't shy away from it. He says in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. He always does what he sees the father doing. Of the father it said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And now the Son, in response to that giving, submits himself to the cross. Hebrews 12, verse 2, tells us that he endured the cross, despising its shame. We can't hardly enter into the physical aspects of the cross and the mental anguish of the foresight of that cross. But he didn't shy away from it. He was ready to die. From his youth up it had been obvious, and now even more so. And he goes to the cross willingly, and he says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do when they put him to the shame of the cross. In exchange for the joys that were set before him, he endured that cross and despised the shame. In exchange for the glories of heaven, uh, he went through as a man on earth the awful experience of death on a cross. But God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name. And this is the one whom we exalt today. And we look at the man who's our example, a perfect example of submission and sanctification and readiness, ready to die from his youth up, but now exalted to heaven's heights of glory. Enjoy that with me, will you? Mm -hmm.